Yeah, so it's really a pleasure to have a chance uh, to present this work, which gave me a chance to work with uh, a lot of wonderful people that I didn't have a chance to collaborate with before. I think that's for me the biggest value uh, of what I'm going to present. And the topic is uh, topological data analysis. Um, so the mindset is machine learning, right? Which uh, arguably is all about extracting the robust, the really pertinent information from data sets. Like, you know, whatever you're learning from this, this point cloud here, you probably want to learn the same thing if I were to rescale it a little bit, or maybe I rotate it a little bit, or maybe even smoothly deform it a little bit, right? Um, in, 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 in pictures, you know, a cat is a cat is a cat, no matter what you do with that. And if you take this line of reasoning of extracting the most robust features out, uh, you kind of end up with the topology of data, uh, the connectivity that we're trying to understand. Um, and, and this is exactly what topological data analysis is about. So uh, TDA is not one thing. There, there are many things that people do that is called topological data analysis. Uh, but most of these things involve something which involves a pipeline like this. So uh, we start with a point cloud, a cloud of points, which exists in some potentially high dimensional ambient space. Uh, and then we put them together to build a solid object. Uh, for instance, we might be uh, connecting the dots if they're close enough according to some closeness criterion, ending up with an object which is technically a, a simplicial complex. So it should be you know, a bunch of tetrahedra and other solid objects which are somehow connected. Uh, but in our case, it would be a special simplicial complex which is built out of graphs, where I take my graph and I look at all uh, cliques of the graph, all uh, uh, subgraphs which are maximally connected, and they form the simplices. And the, the faces of these simplices, of these cliques, are going to be subcliques of one ver vertex fewer. And now, when we have such, a, such an object generated from our, our point cloud, uh, we can start analyzing its topological features. So, for instance, we might be caring whether this object is connected or how many connected components it has, which will be, the count would be called the zeroth Betty number. Or I might care about whether it has these one-dimensional holes that you see here, and their count would be the first Betty number. And so on and so on, the thing grows in higher dimensions. And in the end, the features that I'm talking about is really this vector of Betty numbers. So the counts of k-dimensional holes present in this, this full object that we generated from our uh, point cloud. And to, to give a small disclaimer immediately, uh, in TDA we often care about persistent homology, so the persistence of these holes as we're changing this, this coarse graining. And maybe Andras, Andras, are you here finally? No? He might be mentioning when he arrives in, in the next talk a little bit more about this. But for me, I want to care about extracting these features from my data set, so the, the vector of these Betty numbers, the counts of k-dimensional holes. And now, uh, there's a piece of mathematics called Hodge theory, which gives us a linear algebraic way of extracting these numbers out. Uh, so there's an object called a combinatorial Laplacian. It's a linear operator, uh, which is sort of a generalization of the graph Laplacian. But instead of talking about connectivity of vertices, it talks about connectivity of cliques. Um, so the kth combinatorial Laplacian talks about connectivity of k plus one cliques. Please ignore this fact that it's shifted by one. It's, it's, it's a convention. But what was proven, that the current dimension of the kernel of this uh, kth combinatorial Laplacian is equal to the kth Betty number, to the count of these k-dimensional holes. And uh, as we'll see shortly, uh, this operator here can be uh, as much as n choose k plus one dimensional. So in principle, it's combinatorial in size. Uh, it's Hermitian, they will see. You can compute sparse access for its entries. So, you know, if you know anything about quantum algorithms, it, it writes itself, right? It's, it's right here. It's, it's very obvious, right? But, um, you know, b before going into, into the, the, the nitty-gritty, um, let, let me share a, sort of a personal experience how I got into TDA, uh, which happened in around 2018. So, of course, at the time, topological data analysis in the classical world was becoming more popular as a technique to study uh, and investigate difficult to characterize data sets. But also, uh, Lloyd, uh, Zanardi, and Garneron, they came up with an algorithm already in 2014 for, for sort of quantum topological data analysis, for a quantum method for investigating these Betty numbers. And it was a linear algebraic algorithm in nature, right? It deals with linear algebra. And you might remember in 2018, we had this, you know, decimation of exponential speedups for linear algebraic algorithms by results of, of uh, Ewan Tang and Andras and, and others. 
but but interestingly, this one seems to have survived, right? There was no paper, and now we quant STDA as well, right? So that was very very curious, and it piqued our, our curiosity. And then over time, more and more people studied uh, this problem, and now we've discovered many other interesting connections. I really hope you attended Marcus. Uh, talk on Monday, they, they work with, with Tamara about connections with uh, complexity theory and class QMA, uh, QMA1 and, and connections also with the class DQC for some generalizations of the problem. And then again, thanks to Marcus and Chris Cade and Ed Witten, maybe, um, they discovered connections between topological data analysis and supersymmetric theories. And, and quite deep and profound ones, um, and also hardcore fermionic models. And then today we will be talking about topological data analysis and the question of whether this thing is actually going to generate any sort of a real-world advantage, not in the NISC era, but maybe in the first generation of, of fault-tolerant quantum computers. So I deeply apologize for the bad joke, but I cannot help it. It's as if topology is well connected, right, to everything. Good, so now, I, now we can stop with the fun stuff and go into the technical details. So I want to reason about cliques, so maximally connected subgraphs on a quantum computer. So I'm going to associate the vertices of a graph with the qubits. And setting a qubit to value 1 means that I'm considering that particular sub qubit in my, uh, sorry, vertex in my subset. So in a complete graph, every single bit streak is a clique, right? And then the weight tells me the, the size of the clique. But if I have a graph which maybe doesn't have all the edges, then some of the bit strings do not correspond to clicks, to click just to a subset of the vertices. And this restriction from the complete thing to the particular graph that I've generated in my TDA pipeline is going to be very relevant uh, as we go along. Um, now that we've discovered the set sort of the stage for how we're going to encode things, I need to define the so-called boundary map. So the boundary map takes a K plus one click and generates a superposition of clicks with one vertex fewer. Essentially, it just goes through the bit string, looks at every single one that appears, and switches them sequentially into a zero. Right? It has not n plus one, k plus one, but k uh, ones here. So it's a very, very simple object. This one I'm going to call the general boundary map. Somehow it, it operates on the complete graph, but it's easy to make it you know, specific to a particular graph by simply putting projectors around, which send to zero everything that is not a valid click in our graph, right? And as I mentioned again, this is going to be very important uh, later on. And now when I have this boundary map, finally I can define the combinatorial Laplacian. It's given by this expression here, so it involves these boundary maps and, it's, and their Hermitian conjugates. And um, I didn't mention it explicitly, but I mean, this object here, it's not difficult to see that it's sparse and that it's easy to compute where the non-zero elements are. This thing is a sum of products of sparse things, so this thing is sparse as well. And as mentioned, what I care about is computing the dimension of the kernel of this object on a quantum computer. Um, so the, the, the first algorithm for this by, by Lloyd Garner and Zanardi, um, they've introduced this very elegant technique for estimating the dimension of a kernel of a Hermitian operator. So essentially, you take a Hermitian operator, if you have sparse access to it, you can simulate it, so you get the, the unitary, the time evolution of the Hermitian operator. Then you can apply quantum phase estimation on this object, get out the eigenvalues, check whether they're zero or one, and check the frequency, right? And the frequency of this thing is gonna be converging to the ratio of the dimension of the kernel and the total dimension of the space. Voila, this is, this is how you can do it. And in fact, you could make it work for the combinatorial Laplacian because it is Hermitian and we, we can compute the sparse access for it. Uh, but there's a slightly more efficient way of doing it, which was also introduced in this first paper. And that is by looking at the so-called Dirac operator. It's s slightly different. So it has these boundary maps. You see the kth, uh, on, uh, the boundary maps on the super diagonal and the Hermitian conjugates on the sub diagonal. And it's an interesting object to consider uh, because the kernel of this operator where when restricted under the right subspace of cliques is actually equal to the kernel of the combinatorial Laplacian itself. That's very easy to check. If you just look at the square of this thing, you're going to get the combinatorial Laplacian here smack in the middle. Right? So that's the object that's, that is good enough. It's not nilpotent, so it's, it's really going to preserve the dimension of the kernel. Um, and, and why is it kind of convenient? Well, because these, these boundary maps have this very, very simple structure. And we'll see in a second that makes it easy to somehow implement block encodings of these things and, and run uh, quantum algorithms. So um, the objective that we kind of started doing in, in, in this work 
was really trying to understand what is the quantum cost with the prefactors, with the actual numbers of running these on interesting size instances. So we cared uh, about, let's say, first generation fault tolerant quantum computers, where by far the most expensive thing is, is doing these Toffoli gates because they, they involve magic state distillation and things like this, the many orders of magnitude slower than anything else. So, so we care about the actual exact uh, Toffoli gate count. Uh, and now if you look at the traditional algorithm for TDA, you're going to see that it has sort of three things that you have to worry about, three algorithmic components, and we improved every single one of them a little bit. And, and I'll tell you very briefly about two of them and in, in a little bit more different, uh, detail about the, the, the remaining one. So first, uh, we have to work in the right subspace. So ideally, we would like to prepare a state which has the support only over the valid clicks of the graph, which you don't know. But what you can prepare is a state which has the support over all constant weights or K-hemming weight bit strings. Um, the coherent superposition of this thing is the Dickey state. And there are well-known algorithms for preparing Dickey states which scale uh, like so. But in our case, we don't really need sort of this, this pure, so to say, superposition. What we really need technically is the purification of the mixed state which has equal support over all the uh, K-weight uh, Hamming states. And this thing can be done a little bit more efficiently through a certain thresholding algorithm inspired by uh, algorithms for preparing entry symmetric states in quantum chemistry. You can ask me later about it if you want to know more. Um, the next subroutine which becomes very important is, as I mentioned, in, in the vanilla algorithm, you'll be counting the number of occurrences of zeros in your spectrum. Um, we want to minimize the total TOEFL count, so we want to quadratically improve that as well. So we're going to be doing quantum phase estimation, sorry, quantum amplitude estimation. Um, but one thing that kind of pains us here is that uh, when you do quantum amplitude estimation, you have the error, epsilon, that you're happy with, but then there's always a probability of getting a number which is outside of your tolerance, right? This is delta. And uh, if you do quantum amplitude estimation naively, sort of with a uniform state in the controlled register, um, you generate sort of this sync window, and the probability of reporting something which is outside of the, of the tolerance is scaling as 1 over delta, right? So it's somehow linear. Uh, but by using something which is known in signal processing as the Kaiser window, which, which has a slightly wider, this, this main lobe, as it's called, we can get um, slightly lower precision, but, you know, an exponentially smaller probability of actually reporting something which is outside. So we get a scaling which goes as uh, exactly like this. So the natural logarithm over 1 over delta. So that, that's very useful, reducing our counts. And then finally, uh, the steps which involve the simulation of the Hamiltonian and estimating the eigenvalue. So let me go into a few more details about this. So standardly, you would do time evolution followed by QPE, followed by counting uh, of the zero eigenvalues. We do something a little bit different. Instead of constructing the time evolution, we'll be, construct we'll be using block encoding of the Hamiltonian and then constructing the so-called qubiterate operator, which is a type of a quantum uh, walk operator, uh, which I'll detail in a second, but I'm going a little bit ahead of myself. And, and that's going to allow us to be a little bit more efficient. And, and the second thing, we're not really going to be doing phase estimation, but rather we will apply a linear combination of unitaries to construct the projection operator onto the effective uh, kernel space. And then we'll do phase estimation, uh, actually rather amplitude estimation, to find out what, what this fraction is. So uh, our starting point is based on DS first reported in, in, in these two papers, again, uh, Marcus and Chris, inspired by uh, 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 hardcore fermionic models, interestingly, which was that this, this global Dirac operator, which has all of these uh, boundary maps in the super and sub-diagonal, actually has a remarkably simple form in terms of poly operators. It's exactly this guy here. With these Ds, introduce the phase that is happening depending on the parity of the number of ones, and the X, X flips uh, the, right, the right qubit. Okay. Uh, and now to make it, make it graph specific, you just have to sandwich with the, with the projection operators. Okay, so uh, the thing is for this guy here, we have very good tools from quantum chemistry already, exactly these operators. Um, and in particular, this circuit here, when conditioned on the uniform superposition state in the, co in, in the control register, realizes this operation. What well, that means, this is already the block encoding of this operator here. And now, uh, from this, if we had the projection operators on the both sides, we would really have the block encoding. Um, but as I mentioned, we go and build the qubiterate operator, uh, which absorbs these projections, and we get a, a unitary whose phases, eigenphases, are the arc sign of the rescaled eigenvalues 
of the Hermitian operator that we wanted to simulate. And on this, we just apply linear combination of units with the so-called Chebyshev filter, which is going to throw away everything which was not the zero eigenvalue in the original Hamiltonian and, and project to one everything else. And the overall cost is going to be just linear in the gap of the Hamiltonian and uh, the total dimension of the system. Uh, and, and then we do careful counting of the resources, which was uh, rather painful. Um, and for the relative error R of the estimation of the beta number, we get these three main terms. Um, and now, if we really care about the regimes where things are kind of difficult computationally, we find that this we can ignore and this we can ignore, and these two terms kind of cancel out, and we have this dominating factor. So it's the combinatorial coefficient divided by the actual beta number which dominates our runtime. And our next question is, okay, so how does this scale, how does this compare to classical algorithms, and whether there actually exist graphs and data sets where this makes a difference, right? More precisely, where it makes a big difference, super polynomial difference. So we're interested in the following. The classical algorithm, we say, can always solve the problem uh, in, in resources which scale as a number of clicks. This is sort of the, the space that you need, but, and also the time that you need to solve the problem using traditional methods, uh, whereas quantumly we have this term here. And we want this thing to be significantly larger than this. So we're looking for graphs which are large in click number, yet beta dense, so that the beta number is close to the combinatorial coefficient. And it's not clear that this thing should exist. Uh, because dense graph means that it has a lot of edges, but then it cannot have a lot of holes. And I want to have a lot of edges and a lot of holes. And that's kind of hard to achieve. It was not clear whether it exists. So first of all, um, the algorithm is always going to scale within the number of, number of vertices, but also the dimension of the hole we're inspecting, this is the parameter k. If that thing is constant, classical runtime is polynomial, no super polynomial speed up. If I take the next natural thing, and that's a linear scaling uh, of k in the total size of the graph, um, it was not clear. So we found a family of graphs which are sort of extremal in the, in the, number, in the size of the Betty number. These are these n-vertex k partite complete graphs, which are wonderful because using something called Kunet formulas, you can actually compute analytically easily the Betty numbers, get the exact costing for the classical and quantum algorithm, and find out it doesn't work. The speedups are not going to be super polynomial. The best you can do is uh, sort of a polynomial speedup, but luckily to arbitrary degree. However, if we switch to the polylogarithmic regime, then it works. Then we find that the classical runtime can be expressed as the alpha power of the quantum runtime where alpha actually scales in n. So it's a true super polynomial speedup. And for the particular case where k scale is the logarithm of n, we get a polynomial runtime for the quantum algorithm and super polynomial for the classical, which is somehow what we're hoping to find. And we actually did the numbers to kind of understand, does this matter, right? Because what if we make these things concrete? So uh, for this, this type of graph with k16 and n, n equals 256, we get that the click number is 10 to the 19, which is like three to four orders of magnitude more memory than the superclusters have. Uh, quantumly, we need 80 billion Toffolis. That's a lot of Toffolis, and I wish Ryan Babush was here to tell you that it is not that bad, maybe, maybe, in the first generation, but we're not going to claim that. But these are the numbers we get, right? This is, this is, what, is what is really happening. So it's not completely out of the question. It could, it could make a difference from this perspective. And that brings me to the end. Um, so it's first, well, take home. Topological data analysis is cool. Let's take home. It's connected to everything. It's, 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 it's deep and wide and applicable. So I hope you take that. Uh, we've introduced a number of new subroutines uh, which make it more efficient uh, and also proven the existence of uh, certain classes of these graphs which, which allow for these super polynomial separations. Nathan, I don't know if you're here. I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to talk about your classical algorithm for TDA. Uh, no, your Simon, which is also very interesting. Uh, but I hope you're going to take a look at our friend's results as well. Thank you. Hey, we have question time for questions. Okay. Thanks for the talk, Vedran. Um, you're talking about a speed up. Uh, is this a speed up over the best known classical algorithm, or is it really a provable speed up about uh, better than anything that any classical alg algorithm could ever do? We are considering a particular approach, and an approach a particular case for the classical algorithm, where the assumption is that it scales the classical algorithm with the actual click numbers. There are sampling techniques which are more efficient for this case, but we still get super polynomial separations for the ones that we 
What do we know? But we don't have a proof that there's no classical algorithm that cannot do this in polynomial time. Yet. Looking at you two guys. Hi. I'm quite in interested in the bit where you talked about um, specific families of graphs and the speedups depending on this family of graph. So uh, the question I have is uh, two things. One, what can we learn from looking at specific families of graph beyond um, that like we have a speed up in some regime, maybe not a practical one. So what, what can we learn beyond that? And secondly, if you're this, the question is if you're still looking at these sorts of families of graph for any other purpose. Okay, uh, let, me, let me go sequential. So the first question, what did we actually learn? Yeah. Number one, it was not clear that these things should exist. There was, it was phrased as a question in 2019 by, by some of our friends. Um, they don't seem to exist for the exponential regime, but they do for this uh, super polynomial regime. Whether they're frequent, well, you see, we have to prove the, we have to compute the Betty number. We have to prove that these things are large enough. That's not difficult, easy to prove, right? So I don't know how frequent these things are. We would expect not very frequent. It would be very special cases. So in general, I would not expect such, such things. But let's not conflate asymptotics versus real world performance. We don't know how these things behave for the real world. And I think your second question was, was in that direction. Like, do these graphs actually have anything to do with the real world? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we, we want to understand if this is useful. We don't know yet, right? We have indication. We have evidence it's not. We, we don't know how to prove that it's not useful yet. So let's put it that way. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Um, for me as an outsider, it's a bit difficult to judge what applications of topological data analysis are legit and which aren't. So could you please share some insights? Okay, uh, that's a very difficult question. I'm not a TDA application expert by far. I can tell you what people have been doing with TDA. They've been looking at, for instance, um, brain architecture from, from functional NMR scans. They've been looking at, at metabolic pathways in biology. There's been a lot of medicine work where topology somehow seems to play a role. We have a, a close friend, Nick Sale, who's looking at application of TDA in high energy physics data, both experimental and very theoretical things in studying lattice models where he can detect vortices using TDA. Asterix, not in the regimes where we get a quantum speed up, but never mind. Um, I know people have looked into using TDA even for, for somehow characterizing entanglement in density matrices. Uh, that's something which is kind of seem close to us, but uh, I don't know. My, my feeling is people are interested, but there's not like overwhelming evidence that this is going to be absolutely necessary for us to make whatever the next step might be. I, I do not know. Yeah. Okay, well, we had efficient algorithms and we have an efficient uh, question period, but it looks like there's one more. Hey, thank you I, for the great talk. Uh, maybe I missed uh, it, but I'm assuming the data is defined as vertices and edges, and how, uh, maybe I missed it, but how is the dick state uh, re, uh, restricted to only the simplest k simplices that are in the complex? Right, uh, the dick state is not. Yeah. But the so fact is that we start from a Dicke state kind of increases the efficiency of the overall algorithm mm -hmm. because we only have to project down from the Dicke state to the actual clicks right. as opposed to the uniform mixture of the entire Hilbert space to the thing. So it's a, it's a technical step, but we do have a restriction uh, in the qubit rate operator. I, I, I can right. show it later where, where it does have to happen. Yeah. Okay, maybe I could ask a quick question. Sure. So, um, the uh, the Kaiser windows, mm -hmm. how does that compare against a strategy of, for example, computing the phase estimation into multiple registers and then taking the median? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's, uh, I, I like this question because this was invented by Dominic and I asked him exactly the same thing. Uh, the answer is this is in some sense optimal. Like, so these Kaiser windows are, are uh, an approximation of the Slepnik windows, which are, you know, the, the, the solution to an optimization problem where you want to maximize the, the amount of energy in the main lobe. And this is going to be resource, whatever you do, the most resource efficient thing you can do if you want to have an exponential decay of the tails. So it's, it's going to have a fewer gate count. I see. So they're both exponential, but yeah, yeah, that the, one the, has the pre I the, see. The prefactor is going to be different. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's thank Vedran again for a very clear thank talk. You.